Um, so my name is Daniel Castro. I'm a senior analyst here at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation and the director of our new Center for Data Innovation. I'd like to welcome you to today's event, uh, as well as um, let you know we're webcasting today's event, so uh, welcome to everyone who's joining us on the webcast. Uh, the event will be recorded and the video will be put up on our website after the event, if you'd like to access it there. Um, also, we um, will be accepting questions via Twitter um, if you're participating remotely or if you're in the room and you want to ask a question via Twitter as well. Just use the hashtag ITIF. Um, we're also going to save plenty of time at the end for uh, Q&A for anyone here in the room. So today's event is titled, Has the NSA Won the Crypto Wars? And this is a, a reference to um, the fact there is this big public debate in the 90s about cryptography uh, that was collectively known as the Crypto Wars. And the debate was principally about three different things. Um, whether the public should have access to strong encryption, whether US companies should be able to export um, products employing strong encryption, and then whether the US law enforcement agencies and intelligence communities should have access to some kind of back doors to access <coughs> secure communications. And I think um, until recently, most people would agree that the public and commercial interests at the time had decisively won that debate. Um, and their proposals like Clipperchip were off the table and, and weren't going to be happening. And of course, uh, since then, if we look back over the past decade, uh, we've seen that strong encryption has become widely available, widely deployed um, in commercial products that's used to secure electronic communications, electronic transactions. Uh, this integral to basically every online service that we use, um, and it's at least partially responsible for the great growth and success of the internet economy. Uh, but recently what we've learned is that the intelligence community has apparently uh, decided that if they couldn't do what they wanted to do out in the open, that they were going to do it covertly. And so the NSA has been allegedly, of course, um, busy at Fort Meade, uh, secretly weakening uh, cryptographic protocols, uh, influencing standard committees, and uh, introducing backdoors into the commercial products. If true, uh, these allegations, of course, have very serious implications for citizens, uh, for businesses, and for government, uh, both in the United States and abroad. Today we have, uh, I think, an excellent set of panelists who will um, go through a little bit of the history of what we did in the past, uh, what the discussion was at the time, and how that relates to what's going on now. Um, and what the public debate should be focused on within this aspect of this greater debate about PRISM and what the intelligence community can do. Uh, so we have three panelists, Kevin Bankston, Alan Davidson, and Amy uh, Stefanovic. Is that right? All right. Um, their full bios are online. Let me just briefly introduce them. Uh, Kevin, to my immediate left here, is Senior Counsel and Director of the Free Expression Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Prior to joining CDP, he was a senior staff attorney for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, where he was lead counsel in EFS lawsuits challenging the legality of NSA's warrantless wiretapping program. Um, Alan Davidson is currently a visiting scholar at MIT, where he is a fellow at the Sloan School Center for Digital Business and a research affiliate in the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. Between 2005 and 2012, Alan led Google's public policy and government relations efforts in North and South America. And prior to joining Google, Alan worked at CDT, where he focused on internet policy issues related to free expression, privacy encryption, and copyright law. And of course, was very involved in some of these uh, crypto wars. And uh, last, Amy Stefanovic is director of the Electronic Privacy and Information Center, Electronic Privacy Information Center, sorry, I was <laughs> Epic's Domestic Surveillance Project. And her work encompasses issues including Fourth Amendment, national security, cybersecurity, digital identity, international privacy, and social government. Um, so what I wanted to, to do was really kind of jump in with a discussion about um, where things were back in the 90s. And so I want to start off with you, Al. Um, and I want to start off because you were obviously very involved in, in these discussions at the time. If we were to kind of step back and kind of go in the time machine, we're back there in 1996, 98, um, we're the inventing the <laughs> internet. Uh, but this is really when we're in the kind of heat of the debate about, uh, you know, should we have something like flip the chip? What role should NSA have in deciding these protocols? Walk us through a little bit about what was going on at the time and how you saw the debate uh, Well, first of all, thank, thank you for ha having us and, um, and thank you for hosting this discussion. It's kind of a, oh, there we go. 
Thank you for having us. Thank you for hosting this discussion. Uh, it's great to see some familiar faces in the room, a little bit of a uh, reunion for the uh, encryption, the encryption band back together again, uh, because these issues have, that many people thought had disappeared for a while, are clearly back front and center. And uh, right, in terms of the mid 90s, um, right, it was, it was a simpler time. Uh, you know, the Backstreet Boys were at the top of the charts. Uh, uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin were mere graduate students at uh, Stanford. Mark Zuckerberg was probably 11. Um, no, but, but uh, the internet was also not as big a thing, right? But there was a sense that it was going to be a, a big thing, it was an important thing. And there was a big debate about this question of how we would secure communications and internet traffic. And just, I think you, you summed it up very well, that there was a, uh, on the one hand, a very real concern among the national security and law enforcement establishment about being able to continue to get access uh, to communications and to data and knowing that it was going to be important that encryption prevent, created a barrier. And on the other hand, a strong feeling that we needed, if the internet was going to be successful, we needed people to trust it. And that, was, that trust was important for their uh, privacy and individual liberty, and it was also important for electronic commerce. And encryption was a key part of providing that trust. And so we had a debate, and the debate uh, really sprang from uh, two key US policies. One was the idea that we would try to keep encryption only in the hands of good guys, and we define good guys as people in the United States. And we had this notion that we would try to use export controls to keep strong encryption uh, out of the hands of people outside of the United States. Uh, the second idea was uh, that to the extent that encryption was available, it had to have a backdoor built in. It had to have a key that could be held in escrow by the government, or later we had proposals to make sure that keys could be recovered by the government under a certain process. And those twin policies were really under a huge amount of debate, starting with the clipper chip uh, conversation in 1994, the first key effort proposal, and going until early 2000, when um, by executive order, the administration changed the policy and allowed uh, encryption to be exported and really moved away from uh, pushing for key recovery. And so I, I'd say I teach this subject to students up at MIT, and I got to say the kids today can't quite believe that it was like, you know, it's sort of like telling a, you know, a, a story about the invention of a light bulb or something, right? Like, what were we thinking, right? Like, what were we thinking that we could keep math inside the United States? What were we thinking that we could build a system that had a back door into everybody's encrypted and secure traffic, right? I think people look at it now almost incredulously, but that was the debate, and remarkably now, that over 15 years, we're, we're back in that thing. And uh, just, uh, if you can extend on that a little bit, um, talk to me a little bit more about what the intelligence community said they wanted at the time, and how, um, you know, what did they get at the end, and how did you think we kind of left the conversation there? Well, I think uh, the perception was what they really wanted was to be able to surreptitiously access the communications and data of adversaries, right? Um, and then when I, I think the key features of it were being able to get access without the target knowing, um, and to be able to get uh, get it in close to real time. Um, and those requirements were, were at odds with what encryption provides. Encryption is a technology that provides individuals all over the world with the ability to secure uh, their data. And that was, in some ways, a revolution, right? It is a technical revolution, a technical marvel on some level that we could give that power to people. <coughs> On the flip side, you, you, you can see how it's, it's an essential feature of being able to secure, secure communications and make sure that electronic commerce could happen, make sure that people could trust the internet. So that was really what was at odds. You asked what they got at the end. Um, I think most people thought that the debate ended largely with an acknowledgement that there was something more important at stake here, even from the intelligence community point of view and from the law enforcement and national security point of view, which was that we had a mission that to, both to be able to intercept communications, but also to be able to secure communications. That the NSA has a mission of information assurance, uh, that what we care about as a society is not just being able to intercept communications, but also make sure that people could be secure. And I think that many of us thought that we, that the debate sort of ended with a notion that as the internet became more important in people's lives, it was incredibly important to be able to give them those tools without backdoors built in, 
to be able to secure communications, and that U.S. industry needed to be able to provide those tools if the internet was going to be successful and companies were going to be successful. And so it seemed like there was an acknowledgement that that was important. At the same time, I think part of the reason the debate shifted that way was because law enforcement and national security also realized that there were other ways they could get access to the information that they needed, right? That even if you couldn't intercept, for example, a communication in transit, you might be able to get it when it was decrypted, if it was encrypted, I should say, you might be able to get it when it was decrypted at the endpoints. At the end of the day, we're human beings, and we ultimately, messages are most valuable when they can be seen or read or heard by somebody at the end. And that presented another point of access, a point of vulnerability. And so it required some creativity on the part of those who wanted to do interception, but that there was, that the capabilities would still be there. So it wasn't a, it wasn't that everybody just said, too bad, you'll never be able to use these capabilities, we'll never be able to read the communications of bad guys again. It was that we were going to have to do it in a different way, and in a way that still preserved the freedom and privacy and security of people who wanted to communicate online. Okay, so let me, so again, uh, bring Amy and Kevin in. Amy, Amy, are the concerns from then still relevant? Uh, you know, I just kind of went through all the different objections people had at the time. Are those concerns still applied to the day to today? Um, I think they're incredibly relevant, if not more so relevant. Um, I want to actually take a step back in history a little further from when Alan started, because in 1987, around that time, 1985, 1987, when we were really first looking at computers, we got a, a law called the Computer Security Act of 1987. And that law was in response to Reagan's push for the NSA to control computer networks and to set standards for government computer networks. And it pushed the, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, NIST, to keep charge of non-classified information systems. So really we saw the standard within the Computer Security Act to be away from NSA control of certain systems, to be away from that um, interaction. If you fast forward a little bit, now we talked about a shift away from the clipper chip discussions. We see a shift back because in 2002, that, that year being incredibly relevant in the, in the realm of NSA power and authority, in 2002, the Computer Security Act was um, overwritten by the e-government act of 2002, which contained a, a law called FISMA. And that really had a, had a nuanced shift in language from the terms that we saw in the Computer Security Act to the terms that today allow the NSA to consult with NIST. And this is relevant because when we saw recently that NIST was consulting with the NSA to lower their security standards to make us all a little bit less secure, NIST's response was, we were doing this because we're statutorily required to consult with the NSA. So you have to go look at the statute that requires them to consult. And that, that nuance shift in language really makes it more possible. It would have been possible before, but makes it more justifiable that now NSA has both hands in the setting of security <coughs> standards in order to make everybody a little bit weaker um, online and in their, the security of their transactions. Great. I, I want to come back a little bit uh, to, to the role of NIST. Uh, but Kevin, let me kind of bring you in on this. Um, I mean, in terms of you know what, what you've heard so far, how do you think you know, the kind of recent actions of the NSA compare to what we thought we decided at this time? So, whoa, pardon me. Uh, pardon me, everyone online. Um, we had an extensive public definitive debate in the 90s about whether we should be able to use strong encryption without having to hand the keys over to the government. Um, and the answer was yes, both uh, for security reasons. We wanted to be able to secure our communications uh, strongly against uh, you know, malevolent actors, be they criminals or foreign governments. Um, we wanted to maintain economic competitiveness of US hardware and software vendors, as well as the competitiveness of online services compared to offline services, and be able to assure people that those would be as secure as offline services. And we wanted to preserve and protect civil liberties and First and Fourth Amendment values, and being able to secure your communications uh, including against secret government prying is part of that. Um, and so we decided that uh, the idea of a key escrow, a mandatory key escrow system, where we had to hand our keys over to a trusted third party who then the government could then seek the keys from when necessary, 
uh, was bad for liberty, bad for security, bad for economic competitiveness. It turns out that there has been a secret mandatory key escrow program that we never knew about uh, at the NSA, whereby uh, by hook or by crook, by theft or compulsion, um, the NSA has been collecting a massive key ring of uh, keys, including keys to cryptographic standards that are used to secure millions upon millions of people's communications at one time, such that a single key uh, can be applied to a huge set of data that has been snipped off of the internet backbone and decrypt uh, the communications of millions of people. Um, so not only are we just not only are we talking about a surveillance issue, we're talking about a mass surveillance issue uh, on a scale that I think we never could have uh, understood in the 90s when the uh, commercial internet was just beginning. So I think that the uh, problems that we were concerned about in the 90s are not only still relevant, I think they're magnified uh, after the uh, broad uptake of the internet, the globalization of the internet. And I think that the concerns that we had then uh, are just as relevant now. And so let, let me kind of play with the advocate here. Right? I think what um, this makes me think of, uh, you know, I'm not a big Trekkie, but I saw the, the reboot of Star Trek. And uh, so in the reboot, one of the, the first things Kirk's uh, thinking is uh, Starfleet having or whatever, right? and Spock has this test. And the whole point is the test is supposed to be no one can win. Um, and so he changes the test so he, he, he defeats the test, but it's because he cheated. He, he went outside the system, and, and so Kirk says, well, you know, who said that's not allowed? And it seems like this is kind of the same principle here, where, um, you know, was this, you know, just a kind of clever workaround the NSA to, to get what they needed to get? Um, or is this, you know, uh, Bruce Schneier, you know, said, well, um, you know, this was cheating. They didn't, they didn't do the hard math. They, they cheated and kind of went outside the system. Is that just what the NSA should do in this kind of environment? I mean, it depends on which of the issues we're talking about. It seems from the reporting, which is still rather vague, that there were a broad range of things at issue. Part of it was simply code breaking, which I think we expect the NSA to do, and we want the NSA to do, although we want them to break codes against bad guys and not necessarily break codes that are protecting the privacy of millions of ordinary Americans. Um, subverting standards, which is something I think we should spend some serious time on, is, I think, cheating in the worst way. It not only subverts the standards themselves, but subverts the ability to have standards at all um, and makes us not competitive and makes us less secure against the NSA and everyone else. Um, and then there's the issue of secretly compelling companies to build backdoors, which uh, I'm happy to talk more extensively about that, but I think is, is not legal under the current law and is something that we should be very worried about. Um, I guess just to amplify, with, with all due respect to the Kobayashi Maru scenario in Star Trek, I think this is this is a little bit different. I should say, and I sort of alluded to this, I don't think anybody is surprised that the NSA, like a lot of other governments around the world, is trying to get access to uh, encrypted communications, encrypted data. And I think that was expected. Uh, as I even said uh, when I was speaking before, I think there was an understanding that uh, there would be new methods of getting access, and, and methods, by the way, that really bear, we, we should be having a public conversation about how those methods are used, how uh, the government gets access to someone's cell phone, uh, somebody's uh, laptop, uh, how they get plain text at the end point, and what the legal standards are. Uh, so, but, but I think there were three things, and actually Kevin mentioned, mentioned a few of them, that I think are striking about the revelations that have come out in the last few months. First is, I think, the apparent success that um, the government has had in getting access to some of the very commonly used um, algorithms uh, that are out there, uh, some of the most commonly used algorithms. And I, I suspect that's a surprise to some people. Um, the second is the government's involvement in the standards process. And I think that is a big surprise to a lot of people. I was surprised by it. And it's disappointing because um, there's a tremendous amount of expertise, particularly at the, at the NSA, that people would like to be able to have uh, inform how we keep ourselves secure in a positive way. And this has really undermined the trust that in, in this community of people who build secure uh, systems. And it's going to be very, very difficult for anybody to trust the NSA to be involved in, in any of these kind of conversations for a long time. And I, I'm, I think there's a lot of work to be done to figure out how to repair that breach if we even want to. Um, 
and it's going to undermine uh, the faith in the standards that the U.S. government has endorsed, uh, which are very important standards for a lot of internet users. And then the third thing that I think is uh, is a little is, is a little surprising and is worth noting is is these allegations about what companies have been forced to do, and uh, I think you're already seeing a lot of companies uh, bending over backwards as much as they can to disclaim any involvement in building in backdoors. It is terribly uh, debilitating and undermining of U.S. companies to have the rest of the world to have our own consumers here thinking that backdoors have been built into systems to help the U.S. government. And I think that is going to have a very uh, damaging long-term, could have a very long, damaging long-term effect on our industry here and on faith in the systems we build. And that is not good. It's not good for our economy. It's not good for liberty. And it is also not good for the very security interests that want to have access to those uh, systems. So I think Kevin and Alan covered a lot of it, just a couple points, because I think Kevin hit the nail on the head when it comes to if we want NSA breaking encryption standards of everybody, if we want them breaking encryption standards of just the bad guys. Because one of the things that we have learned this summer is that the NSA really takes a presumption that if you're engaging in encryption, if your messages are sent um, in any, with any sort of encryption, that you are a bad guy. They think that that um, activity of encrypting your message makes it possible for them to keep and retain your um, encrypted message for as long as it takes them to decrypt it, which is which is troubling in light of what um, what came out later. The other thing I would say is something the NSA has trumpeted loudly um, since June 5th and since the, the beginning of the release of documents is that there's a process you go through. There's a process you go through if you want to engage in activities if you want to alert somebody that something is going on. And we went through that process, as Alan described, we went through that process in the 90s in regard to if the NSA could build in back doors, if the NSA could get access to encrypted communications. And that pro the result of that process was that the NSA should not have been allowed to do this. And yet they did it anyway. So in answer to the, the question of if they're cheating, um, not only are they cheating, but they're being incredibly hypocritical about it. And Amy, I want you to um, extend a little further on what you brought up earlier about um, you know, FISMA and the Computer Security Act. And um, I mean, tell me a little bit about you know how you, know, you started into this, but how should we characterize this relationship with the NSA right now? Um, and is that relationship appropriate? Um, so it, there's there's two different levels of this interaction with the NSA. There's what they say they're doing. They actually say that they don't consult with the NSA too often, um, which I think we have to question in light of the fact that we know that they've been dishonest with us, the government has been dishonest with us throughout this entire process. And then there's the objective standard where you look at the language in FISMA and what the NSA can compel and can request NIST to do. And that language is incredibly troubling. It, it really um, describes a close relationship between the two agencies and a relationship where the NSA can compel a reduction in NIST security standards in order to preserve or to complement, I think complement is the language used in the law, their own um, gathering of data. And that law, the, that shift in the law um, back in 2002 really hasn't gotten a lot of attention and because there's a failure of transparency in the government and with this cooperation between agencies, specifically in this case NIST and the NSA, we are, haven't been aware of how deep that connection runs and we still really aren't aware. I would, I would just add a, I think, obvious but fundamental point. When you have the same agency in charge of both code breaking and information <coughs> assurance, I think you have a fundamental conflict of interest that leads to just this issue. Um, and that it may not be an easy or, or a, a thing to accomplish, but I think long term we need to figure out a way to, to split apart those two functions and not have the same agency in charge of both breaking and strengthening our codes. Well, just to um, extend on that a little bit. So, I mean, you know, NSA is responsible, um, at least they were, and so correct me if I'm wrong on this, um, the NSA is responsible for the security of classified systems. Uh, and setting the security standards of them. Uh, they're also, of course, responsible for breaking into systems all around the world. So they have, they have that dual mission 
even with just themselves. And then when you expand that, and this has the mission of protecting unclassified government systems, and then of course we have widespread adoption in the commercial sector of this standards. Um, can you can we talk about this? You know, this is a kind of a big area, but how might how might this whole you know arena be improved? Should government still be in the business of helping lead the development of standards? It seems like it's been a very useful and fruitful activity. Um, yet at the same time, obviously, it's been severely damaged. Um, I think that there, are, if the government decides to reach, to stay in this field, and I think NIST has done a good job establishing itself, um, despite the, its interactions with NSA, as somebody who can lead um, setting of standards, not only in the U.S. but throughout the world, that there are there are definitely things that have to change. One of those is we need. Um, incredibly greater transparency about NIST's interaction with the NSA moving forward. We need something on the record to explain when they interact, what those interactions, what the standards are before, and how NSA has influenced them, and what the outcome of any interaction is. And that needs to be put on the public record. Um, the second thing is we need um, changes, not only in FISMA, but under the Freedom of Information Act, a lot of the communications between agencies cannot be disclosed to the public because of an exemption to the Freedom of Information Act, um, B5, which allows for redaction of interagency communications. Um, we, I think we need to re-examine that standard and find out when interagency communication should be properly disclosed because it's, it's really put into place um, quite often to keep out of the public light information that might be embarrassing to the government. And I think we all know that information shouldn't be withheld just because it might embarrass the government. So that's transparency, um, change in B5, and I think we need to greatly limit and expressly provide when NIST can consult with the NSA to begin with. So not only do we need transparency when they do consult, but we need to make sure that they can't consult in order to preserve their own ability to collect information. Um, let me ask uh, for Alan and, and Kevin. Do you think this role should stay within the, the U.S. federal government? Should we look into broadening it out inside um, government, or or you know, do you agree with Amy and, and you can sufficiently fix the process uh, so that it works going forward? Uh, I, well, I think, you know, it's uh, much remains to, to be learned, I think, and uh, maybe the jury is still out. There's there's a lot of that felt value in having government engagement, missed engagement in the standard setting process. These are standards that have been very popular, widely, uh, widely adopted. Some now have called for more private sector oriented standard setting at the IETF or other places. I will say, you know, we've had a, a fairly um, transparent and open Process. I mean, some many would argue it's been a relatively transparent process relative to how some other governments have operated in this space. We've selected uh, technologies and systems from outside of the U.S. It hasn't been a purely U.S.-focused uh, process, which I think is to its credit, would come for the best systems that are out there. So there are a lot of reasons to think that this is a system that could work, continue to work well. But the kinds of changes that Amy uh, has outlined are probably uh, you know, there's a there's a question about whether even they will be enough to restore the kind of faith that people are ultimately going to need if they're going to adopt these standards, going you know continue to use these standards going forward. Actually, in the short term, there's probably not a lot of options. In the longer term, mid to longer term, people are going to be looking at other options. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a big difference between fixing NIST such that it is trustworthy and having people actually trust NIST again. Um, and it may be that a move towards something a bit more multi-stakeholder involving um, other governments civil society, technical experts, on the model of the W3C or IETF or ICANN um, might end up being necessary, if only because uh, NIST has, has lost a lot of trust due to, to these things. And let me ask uh, you to speculate here a little bit. Um, one of the things that we saw in this kind of uh, stream of stories that came out, we had in you know, the New York Times and the Guardian initially make these reports. We had uh, Director of National Intelligence come out and say, you know, this is what we do. There's nothing to be concerned about here. And then a day later, or a couple days later, we had NIST issue their statement that said, um, first of all, that they were going to be reopening public comment on three standards uh, related to random number generators. And then they also, within that, actually recommended that 
um, the public, uh, they, they strongly recommended uh, that the public no longer use uh, one of these particular uh, uh, random number generators. And, and random number generators are kind of a key building block of uh, cryptographic protocols. <laughs> Um, and, then, and then finally, uh, after that, uh, the, the head of NIST issued a statement saying that you know, this does not deliberately weaken uh, any protocols. So I guess my, my question to you is, um, to what extent is NIST acting kind of with free agency here? Um, do you think that they, they are just able to salvage their reputation, that this doesn't fall in the line of what they've had to do with NSA? Because there's clearly um, two different uh, messages here. One is, um, that you know, we're just doing what we're supposed to be doing. That's what the intelligence community said. And then this says, um, no, you still should trust us. And look, we're even telling you, don't use this one anymore. Seems like there's a little bit of a mixed message there. Do you want to speculate on that? Not especially. Um, <laughs> Alan? <laughs> well, I just think we're seeing at play here in some ways this tension between uh, the desire to be able to do interception and the, the need for good information assurance and. Um, you know, uh, I don't know what to say other than to say, first of all, I mean, I'm sure that there are people at NIST who are keenly interested in trying to maintain their credibility and the trust of the global community. And uh, I think it's going to take a fair amount of work to make that uh, real. Uh, and we will see how the market adopts over time. But that, I would say I think this is exactly why the entire approach has been so short-sighted, right? Because um, if we are seen as being a nation that builds vulnerabilities <laughs> into everything that we can get our hands on, right? Into any standard that we're involved in, into any product that's developed on our shores, then people are not going to trust the systems that are built here. And that, in turn, not only is that bad for the internet community, because so much of what's important is being built here. So many of the products and services are being run from that by US companies. But <laughs> it's terrible for the US intelligence uh, community, right? I mean, we, we benefit a great deal from from the traffic that uh, gets intercepted on, on our shores, from the products that we uh, know are being built here by the expertise that we have in this country, right? And I just think, you know, driving all of that traffic away, driving the products away, and uh, driving the expertise away is not in our long-term interest. If I could, I mean, if I could just build on that in a variety of ways. First off, the fact that NIST, in order to build trust, has to say don't trust us is a demonstrator of what a, you know, how they're really in a, between a rock and a hard place. But I think that the example of random number generators is a good example of how, by weakening that standard, you've assisted every other code breaker, not just the NSA. You have weakened standards for everybody in a way that empowers other spies as well as our spies. No? Chris is saying no. Okay. This is a very, a very specific kind of potential backdoor in that only the people who, who know the particular inputs can leverage it. This isn't like weakening. Uh, this well, is that's why we, we need a technologist on the panel. But um, <laughs> well, you can say that's, that's true of this particular random well, this number. Particular one. But the, the as a general principle, the notion of introducing vulnerabilities, I think, is one that we should be aware of, that, that, that technologists have written about the risks and costs that come from introducing them. Thank you, um, and uh, and you know we don't want to be in a position where our vendors, when trying to sell outside of the country, are treated like we are now treating Huawei. However, you pronounce how do you how do you pronounce that? Yeah, Huawei. Um, where where your products are not trusted and, and not purchased and uh, and are restricted. Um, I wanted to talk briefly, uh, if we can now, about the issue of mandatory backdoors, which is something that has been hinted at in the stories, um, and we has also been. Uh, implicated in the shutdown, the voluntary shutdown of LavaBit, the secure email service, and Silent Circle, another email service. And um, CDT has expressed a concern that these cases might have involved, or the NSA uh, examples might have involved something we're calling Kalia by court order, which is uh, secret mandatory building of backdoors into services that would otherwise be secure. Um, we think this is clearly not legal. Um, based on a case that I'll tell you about briefly from the Ninth Circuit in 2003, where uh, there was a drug investigation into some gentlemen who uh, drove in an Escalade that had a OnStar or OnStar-like emergency system in the car. And DEA wanted to eavesdrop on the people driving this Escalade um, by opening up the cell phone line used by that emergency service. 
And the emergency service provider said, but if we do that and they get in a crash, the emergency service that we're supposed to be offering won't work. And the wiretap statutes provider assistance provision, which is much like the one used in FISA, the foreign intelligence law as well, said we're supposed to only provide service, provide assistance uh, with a minimum of interference to our service. And so we're not going to do this. And the government said, well, then change your service so that it will, it will work, uh, so that we can intercept and your emergency service will work. And the service said, well, no, we're not actually required to build our service or modify our service to enable your interception. The only people who have to do that are the people subject to CALEA, the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, which applies to, to um, phone providers and since uh, uh, the aughts, the mid-aughts, um, uh, broadband providers. And the Ninth Circuit agreed. And the Ninth Circuit, in a case called USB the Company, because the company itself was anonymous in the case, although it was on-store or an on-store-like company, um, the Ninth Circuit agreed and said that the government cannot mandate a, a provider to change their service to make it wiretappable. And so we are concerned that that may be what is happening in some of these cases. And that's why we're supportive of the sentiment um, that is expressed in Rush Holt's bill, uh, a bill that's much broader than this issue. It also calls for repeal of the entire Patriot Act and some other things. Um, but the New York Times has endorsed this language. And we're supportive of the general principle that the government should not be able to mandate that a secure service be made insecure, um, not only uh, in order to protect civil liberties, but also because that's bad for everyone's security. It's bad for economic competitiveness. Uh, it's bad for the US internet industry and the safety of our communications. And I, I, I don't want to lose that point, so let's, let's stay on that for a minute. Um, I mean, so if we're going back to the uh, crypto wars, you know, the argument then, and this also gets to kind of what, what Chris was talking about, um, the argument then was that, uh, you know, if we're doing Kiastro, there is no security risk that, you know, the government is safely storing these keys. Um, the NSA would say, you know, we, we've safely secured, uh, you know, the, the um, you know, the kind of skeleton key that we have to the random number generator, and nobody can ever steal anything from the NSA, of course. Yeah, that's not true. I think we um, just yeah. But I mean, how how do we how do we legis you know how would we legislate that? Because the argument would always be, well, this is a you know this isn't less secure because we have these countermeasures in place. Um, do you, I mean, do you think the bill does that effectively right now, um, or how would you how would we respond in these cases where this will come up? Is it just something that would always go to the courts? I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure which argument you're asking me to respond to. If it is that we can do key escrow securely, I feel that that's a debate that we had and won in the 90s, which is, no, you can't. There was a great deal of uh, uh, great work done by a lot of people like Matt Blaze and Steve Belden and others about the security risks inherent in key escrow. I think if the assurance is, don't worry, the NSA can keep this stuff secret, Edward Snowden has clearly demonstrated that they can't do that. Um, so I'm not sure if, if that addresses. Yeah, and I, I would just sort of underscore that. Um, at the time in the in the night in the mid '90s, there was a lot of discussion about key recovery, and I think a lot of the arguments are translatable to any kind of guarantee of capability. There was a great paper that CDT put out. I still have a copy of it, autographed by Hal Abelson and folks like Steve Belden and Matt Blaze and some secure, uh, some security researchers talking about the. Uh, the risks and costs that come with key recovery systems, and um, particularly the fact that any kind of, by introducing a vulnerability into these highly secure systems, you inevitably make them well, less secure, uh, more exploitable, exploitable by others. You introduce costs because it's expensive and difficult to do, and you introduce complexity that makes it much, much more difficult to guarantee that they're going to be kept secure in the future, and especially when you're trying to do these things at scale. And I would say that, that those arguments apply, and, and these, these papers have been updated, and there are more recent versions of them, to, to this kind of uh, debate that we're having now, or we're going to have soon, <laughs> which is, what do, can we ask for a guarantee of tappability in new services? Can we make sure that everything uh, that is secured can also be unsecured? And that's a very dangerous argument. I mean, it, 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 it introduces these risks um, that, the, that a lot of the computer security experts have told us about. It raises these questions about individual liberty. It also you know, creates huge problems from a business point of view. Uh, and there are, a lot, there are a lot of companies that are very concerned about the, the cost to innovation. If we say that everything you build, build must now also be built with a back door. And, and we know that there are people who believe that's the approach going forward. 
I think there are a lot of reasons from the technical community's point of view to be concerned and from the business community's point of view to be concerned too. Okay. Oh, um, I just real quick want to expand because the clipper chip argument was well ended at least publicly ended, but one argument has continued <laughs> continued up until um, June when we kind of changed gears and didn't talk about it anymore, and that was the Kalia argument and if the FBI is going dark and if we need to expand Kalia to allow the government to wiretap or to require that more companies be wiretappable. Um, and I think they have also been losing that argument, even though it's been ongoing. They have not been able to show um, this, this quote unquote going dark argument that it has any merits. In fact, I think if anything, what we've seen over the last three or four months has been that the internet, um, as many have said, is going bright. There's so much information available and the NSA is obviously able to still get a massive amount of information um, and I just wanted to add that into it because Kevin did mention Kalia, and, and that argument has very much been taking place in the public sphere. I'll just spin off of that briefly. You know, the irony is we are in a golden age of surveillance, especially for the NSA, and yet we're in a distinct, uh, we're, we're definitely in a position where they, they could very easily kill the goose that laid the golden egg here in terms of intelligence capability. Um, they've been placed in a privileged position because so much data is stored in the US, so much data transits the US. However, to the extent it is uh, not clear that we have strong legal standards governing the access to that data and that we have strong uh, security standards protecting that data, we're gonna see that data go away. We're gonna see that data route around the US. We're gonna see that data stored in other countries. We're gonna see uh, other countries passing laws to force the localization of data in their country, which in many ways will actually be very bad for internet freedom because it will allow uh, countries that we don't necessarily think have the highest standards of uh, civil liberties and, and human rights uh, enable them to engage in more effective uh, censorship and surveillance of their own. Um, and so uh, it may be that uh, the NSA's um, aggressive surveillance of internet communications in the US is eventually going to cost it its intelligence um, advantage. Great. So I, I want to um, dig a little bit more into kind of these implications. Um, before that, uh, before we move on to that, I want to ask kind of again about, uh, we've talked about some of the, the limits um, that could be imposed on the NSA or on the intelligence uh, community. Uh, we talked about the limits on kind of clear uh, like backdoors. Uh, we talked about some of the um, limits uh, that could be imposed on the relationship between the NSA and this. Are there, um, are there other limits that need to be imposed here? Um, do we need kind of you know, rules of war for cryptography, um, both for the United States and other countries? And in particular, I'm talking about, um, there of course were also allegations that not only was uh, NSA involved in standard setting with NIST, but also perhaps outside of NIST and other standards bodies. Um, does NSA's participation in these forums need to be made, um, need to be prohibited, need to be made more transparent? Uh, does, does that, are there other areas? And I'll just open this up to anyone. I mean, I'll leave it to others to discuss the standards issue. I mean, just briefly, NSA, I mean, we've called NSA ethics called just a total black hole. I mean, any information about what NSA does in practice is, is very, very secret, including their consultation with other organizations, um, and that's a problem. In fact, NSA's authority to keep things from the public is so incredibly broad. Um, anything that involves their activities or, um, oh my goodness, what's the information? Systems or activities um, can basically be withheld and totally redacted. And you don't, they don't even have to tell you that the document exists. We went to the NSA years ago um, in the wake of Google being hacked by China, somebody in China, and asked them for details about Google's communications with the NSA because immediately after that hack, um, Google implemented what many technologists, including Chris, had been calling for them to do for a very long time, which was encryption by default. And we wanted to know if that was a result of communications with the NSA. They came back and said, we're not even going to confirm or deny that we've ever talked to Google, received an email from Google. This would have included even an email that Google would have sent to somebody at the NSA saying, we really want you to use our services. We're not going to say that we've ever had any interaction with that company, and they were able to do that. So this is, talking about transparency with the NSA, this is really a problem, and something, um, more information would allow more of these conversations to take place, and to take place in a much more informed manner. 
from from the other side of that, um, you know, when we're looking at what other countries are doing, as we mentioned, we expect other countries to be uh, not like breaking codes, but also perhaps doing the same thing that NSA is doing, trying to influence standards, trying to influence um, you know potential backdoors in their own domestic companies. Is the United States, from the you know, intelligence side of this, just handicapping itself uh, in ways that are inappropriate if it, if it takes a, says there are certain things that we won't do, or is that just what we, we, should, we should be doing going forward? Well, first of all, I don't think we were necessarily expecting every government to be doing all these things, but we should sure expect it now. Um, and I think part of what we have to recognize is that we have a, a policy approach that doesn't scale well globally, i.e. if every other government you take does the same set of things that we think our government may be doing, then uh, that's, that's, that's not a good world uh, to be living in. And it does some real damage to the, uh, to, to the internet. And so I'm not sure that we will be handicapping ourselves by, um, by starting to think about how we, we address these capabilities and put in some good oversight in place, right? I mean, uh, the kind of program that we're talking about, first of all, it's very early we could in this debate to tell you the truth because we really don't know everything that's going on. And there is a promise of more documents to come and more, more revelations to come. So I think we're surprised, more surprised now than we were. We wouldn't be having this conversation two or three months ago. Um, and who knows where we'll be two or three months from now. There's a program that we're talking about that uh, I don't think handicaps anybody, talking, starting with some, a lot more transparency about what's actually going on out there. A potential uh, for really getting the NSA out of the role of adding vulnerabilities to standards and into the role, if, if there's any role, of helping make sure the standards are good and encryption is good and that uh, is a strong thing. There's a longer conversation we need to have about what the rules are going to be for getting access to these capabilities and for use, and, and particularly for access to endpoint communications. And I worry that we just, we haven't even really begun to have that conversation about not just when does the NSA, what are the rules for the NSA getting access to somebody's laptop or phone and some, or, and it's particularly a non-US person. What are the rules going to be for other countries when they try to do that to US citizens? What are we going to do about that? And so, um, so, so, there, so, so I just think trying to come up with some basic rules of the road here uh, is, is just a starting point. And I don't think it's going to handicap us. It will hopefully lead us to a world where uh, there's a little bit more sanity and um, a set of things that people can trust about how, they're, how, how we're going to operate online. I just wanted to also sort of mention this balkanization point that Kevin brought up. I think there's a very real risk out there that if everybody starts to do a lot what we've got, that this really does lead to a world where people say, uh, governments say, data must be kept onshore because we want to be able to have access to it just in the same way that the US government has access to data in the United States. We already have seen a bill in Brazil that asked for something similar. There have been other bills in other countries proposals in other countries in the past that the US government has been extremely helpful in um, stopping, actually. It's going to be a lot harder going forward. And so like a balkanized internet where all data sits within, a, the, the, within the country in which it was created uh, or where a service is offered, it's a very difficult world for people to build to. And it's, it, it doesn't help protect anybody's uh, privacy because the set of rules out there for access to that data are going to be are going to vary widely, and as Kevin said, it's not going to help U.S. security either. And let's talk about that uh, point a little bit because this is something that um, uh, see there's a, a couple papers uh, from IKF in the back on this point. We just had a new paper on uh, local localized barriers to trade. It looks at this issue broadly. Um, it seems like th this is almost a, a potential domino effect um, where we've been able to resist it, as you said, Alan, because you know U.S. trade negotiators have been very vocal on this point. Um, this seems like you know you have one country go down this uh, route, and it, it kind of works for that one country. They're able to you know get the data in their country. They're able to get the benefits of building data centers, the jobs to go with it. Um, but then you have if every other country follows, obviously there's a, a huge cost on the system. Um, but how do we how do we stop that first country? How do we how do we kind of prevent this trend? Because we you know Brazil's looking at it, we're seeing this really all around the world where countries are looking very closely at this as a, you know, if you're looking at it to help 
um, you know, kind of fight back against surveillance, but they're also looking at purely for um, economic reasons. It's, it's a very dangerous thing, and I think we have to move really quickly to try to infuse some trust back into the system here, which is, I think, partly why you're seeing so many of the big companies and organizations out there trying to say, it's not as bad as you think. <laughs> um, because, you know, if you look at the way a lot of the major services are constructed, they're built in such a way that data does largely reside in the United States, and there's a reason for that, which was that we held out this promise to the user community. Data is going to sit in the United States. If governments want to get access to that data, they have to come through the U.S. MLAT process, the international processes for governments to get data from each other. And there was great value in that because there was a feeling that U.S. rule of law actually was pretty consumer friendly and protect, privacy protective. Um, despite all the things we're talking about, there's still an argument that some of that, to some extent, that that's true. And so we were all able to make a compelling argument to people outside the United States: trust these services. Right? That is much harder argument to make right now. Um, uh, I wanted to agree with that and highlight the importance of um, dealing with this trust issue immediately and quickly and decisively. And one of the ways that we're trying to do that is uh, CDP has, has organized a coalition of uh, transparency and free speech and privacy groups and companies such as Google and Microsoft and Yahoo and Twitter and my, uh, Facebook and others uh, to uh, push aggressively for greater permission to be transparent about the government requests they receive and the scale of those requests and the type of those requests and the number of people actually affected uh, so that they can better uh, counter what's been alleged uh, about their services and their cooperation in PRISM uh, uh, in the press. Um, and so just yesterday we uh, delivered a, a letter to Congress um, pressing, uh, supporting legislation uh, that's been introduced that would ungag these companies and allow them to give a lot more information about what they do and just as importantly don't do uh, when the NSA comes calling. So I, I've heard from, um, from everyone here that um, you know you think this will you know hurt U.S. companies, will hurt their ability to sell products um, abroad, and you know this was you know exactly one of the, the main arguments um, back in the crypto wars, right? And so my question really is, why do you think um, you know the NSA knew this? Uh, you know, the intelligence community knew this as a fact. Um, that this was a, a common belief and it was you know, basically accepted. So why didn't this come into consideration in the debates that you know, went on within the intelligence community about what should be done? How do we, how do we make that part of the debate going forward? They thought they could keep it secret forever. And I would just add that, you know, as you said, it was a debate within the intelligence community. And it's not a debate that brings in other, other perspectives. And that's why transparency and oversight is so important. That's why actually some public disclosures and finding, finding ways to do that in a way that still protects the, the, the methods that are viewed as important, but that gives the public some sense of things is important. Um, and I think we have a broken process within, the, within our government and within the administration for thinking about these things. If this conversation can happen solely in a silo, independent or without a strong voice from people who are thinking about the impact on privacy, the impact on industry, those voices need to be louder in the administration and more and stronger so they can bring that perspective when, when there are interagency conversations. Another part of um, limiting the harm when these decisions are made in secret is, is by having clear legal and technical constraints at the front end. And so to jump back to what Alan was talking about before, um, you know, not only do we need to have a discussion about uh, whether and to what extent mandated backdoors are appropriate, we don't think they are, um, but for example, when and how should the government be able to compel the disclosure of key material? Um, you know, this came up in the 90s when they were talking about a key escrow system and, and CDT's position was that at the very least, uh, you shouldn't be able to use a secret subpoena to get someone's keys. Um, I think there's good arguments that you would you should have to get a probable cause warrant before being able to compel keys, especially if we're talking about keys that can decrypt millions of people's communications. Um, the issue of um, <coughs> standards for what, what some authors have called lawful hacking. There's a paper called Lawful Hacking by uh, Belladin Blaze, Susan Landau, and a bunch of other people who were involved in this debate in the 90s, trying to address the issue of, well, we know that the government is at this point, we knew this before the NSA revelations, in certain law enforcement and intelligence investigations is hacking into computers, you know, hacking into the endpoints in order to conduct surveillance uh, rather than doing it in the middle. What are the legal, what are the legal constraints for that? 
Um, you know, what are the constraints in terms of the government, say, purchasing exploits on, on the you know, zero day market? And, and what are the implications of that? I think those are discussions we need to have. Um, and so, uh, and then there's also the issue, I think it's worth noting, it's been alleged that the NSA has actually been breaking into computers to steal keys, um, which, uh, you know, it's worth noting that we do have a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that, that governs uh, and criminalizes breaking into computers, and it's worth noting that that actually applies even to computers outside of the United States if they are used in commerce with or communication with uh, the United States. So I hope that the NSA's counsel uh, are mindful of the fact that the CFA actually does protect computers outside of the United States as well as inside of the United States. Uh, so I want to ask uh, also how this affects kind of these broader cybersecurity goals. Um, you know, for, until the revelations uh, from Snowden came out, um, there's been for the past few years an increasing um, conversation about uh, you know, the federal government's role in improving cybersecurity. There's been uh, different legislative proposals here. We've got, of course, the administration's efforts in this area. Does the U.S. government uh, still have the ability to promote um, good cybersecurity practices? Um, how is this affecting that dialogue? Because it seems like, certainly on the legislative side, um, it's slowed things down. I think it's very not cooperative. So, I mean, a lot of the cybersecurity bills, many of them that we've seen introduced over the last two years, and many of them reintroduced, um, have three elements that really, within, because of revelations over the last three months, make them non-starters. One is the, the massive increase of information that companies can share with the government. Two is the um, immunity for companies who overshare with the government. And the third one is actually, um, in at least one or two of these cases, the bills put in a, a brand new Freedom of Information Act exemption, um, which has not been done since the act was very first passed. Um, it came with a number of exemptions. We've had some statutory exemptions added that, that are kind of built into it under B3, but never has a new section been added to the Freedom of Information Act. So it would actually make government cybersecurity operations even more opaque than they already are. And I know I've been a trumpet for transparency on the side of the table, but it's really troubling when you think we already don't know what the government is doing about cybersecurity authority. I've been litigating against the NSA for three years to try to get their um, one of the presidential security directives out of them that explains what their cybersecurity authority is. They haven't released it to me. It's not classified. Um, we already don't know, and we won't know even more if any of the proposals that are on the table now get passed. Yeah. I would concur. I'd like to be a trumpet for transparency as well. Um, um, we've already talked about, we've all talked about what, how undermining trust actually uh, hurts some of these broader security goals. I just throw one other thing out there to think about, which is an even broader context, which is the internet governance debate that we're in the middle of. And this is, I think, in some ways, from the internet community point of view, an even bigger issue than just thinking about privacy and security, but really thinking about what are the rules of the road for the internet going forward. And we find ourselves now at the ITU in other international forums talking about how should the internet be governed? And there are a lot of countries that have a very, very different view from us, from the United States and its allies, about uh, internet freedom, about the openness of the internet, and how they would like the internet to be governed so that there is more government control over the flow, free flow of information. This is very damaging to our ability to make our case long term in that forum. And if anything, that may be an even bigger loss than all the things that we've been talking about today. Because um, a world where there is much more control over the internet uh, and much more government regulation, uh, in quotes, I put that, but uh, over the internet uh, is a world where we have a very, it's a very different kind of internet than we have today. And what's happened here, I think, is going to really hurt our ability to make good arguments in that internet governance debate going forward. And I think that is very damaging for our long-term goals in terms of promoting values of openness and freedom and human rights uh, around the world. So just to raise the stakes even further. I have one last question on the, the security aspect of this. One thing that we've seen in the past, and I'll direct this to you, Ali, um, since you used to be at, at Google, um, you know, when uh, Google 
became aware of um, security attacks against China, you know, became they went to the government for help. Um, can companies go to the federal government? Can they go to uh, NSA anymore for help with security issues, or is there too much of a um, do they not want to be guilty by association? Obviously, a lot of this is done on transparently to begin with, but do they not want that to even be on their records? Without really talking to what Google did or didn't do, um, I would just say that there we, we know that in the context of all of the security concerns and attacks that companies face, that there are definitely moments when lots of companies, lots of companies that do not have the technical capability, say, of a Google or a major technology company, do need help. And the resources that they can look to are often in the government. And I will just say, it is a really difficult decision for a company to have to make to say, uh, it, it was before this, to say that they're going to ask for that kind of assistance. And we would like to think that the that our law enforcement and uh, security agencies could provide that kind of assistance. I think after all this, everybody has to be even more concerned about getting that kind of help. And um, that's not good for consumers, right? I mean, when a company is attacked, uh, when, when a breach is happening, when the data is vulnerable, right, you want, people, you want people to be out there protecting their services and protecting users. And the government could and should have a role, but it can't if people can't trust it. I, w I would just expand on that and a bit more forcefully say, I think a major internet company at this point would be crazy to invite the NSA into their systems after it's been widely reported that the NSA has covertly compromised US companies' security. Uh, and this highlights the problem, once again, of having information assurance and intelligence under the same roof. You want to have the best mathematicians and security experts in the world be able to help you secure your systems. And right now, NSA has a lock on that market. Um, but when it's the same people who also want to, um, whether by hook, you know, by hook or by crook, whether covertly or over overtly, to compromise the security of your system, um, that's a, going to dissuade you a bit from inviting them into help. And you know, just to put a sharp, another sharp point on it. Uh, you know, at the time, you, you mentioned the, the issue with when Google was attacked uh, by China and uh, uh, made that public in early 2010, I think it was. And at the time, Google said that there were, it knew of somewhere between 30 and 40 other major Western companies that had been the subject of the same attack, but for the most part didn't know about it until Google had told them, right? Uh, those com many of those companies did not have the capabilities or resources to deal with it. There's a clear place where uh, we're, a, we're a government law, enf law enforcement to start with could really provide uh, a major source of help. And I think Kevin is totally right. You'd be crazy to ask for that kind of help now. And uh, that's going to be a real problem. One other point worth making if we're talking about the Aurora attacks uh, on Google and other companies, including Microsoft, it's worth noting while we're talking about back doors, that it has now been revealed that the Aurora attackers, when they compromised Google and Microsoft, went straight for the lawful intercept systems to use them for counterintelligence, to figure out who the US government was spying on. So that's another good example of how having backdoors for interception for surveillance purposes can actually create new security problems. Now, I want to open it up to audience questions. I just have one last question for the panel, and that's really, um, one of the reasons we we're doing this event is because you know, this kind of narrow issue of uh, you know, the debate about photography and NSA's role is just a small piece of this, this bigger uh, picture. Um, so I, I know uh, many of you are involved in uh, the debate, the, the wider debate. So you know, how do you see this aspect of the debate? Um, you know, how does this fit in with the rest of it? Do you think it will receive attention going forward? It's obviously something that is very uh, technical to a lot of people, and uh, in my opinion, often gets kind of swept aside for bigger picture issues. Um, but I just like your take on, uh, you know, whether you think it, how, how do you think it fits into the, the broader debate? Well, if you think that the theme of the broader debate has been NSA activities designed to make us secure, making us in fact less secure, um, less safe, and really 
less comfortable in our interactions on the internet, this fits in perfectly. This is one of the, the prime examples of exactly those things, and that's what we keep seeing over and over again with the NSA's activities that have been exposed. So I think it fits in, and I think it's incredibly important. This is maybe one of the more important revelations that we've had over the last three months. And people are paying attention to it. It might be a little bit more technical than people want to delve into as much. But I mean, when you look at the debates, there have been three levels of um, revelations. The ones that we're uncomfortable with and that we would like to change. The ones that are unlawful. And the ones that are questionable, the ones we need more information on. And this hits all three of those levels, as kind of described earlier. I think one of the ways that this issue fits in uh, that we haven't discussed yet is um, I think you're going to see a lot of things coming from the companies voluntarily to try and address this threat. Um, you know, we've already seen Google and, and soon Facebook adopting something called perfect forward secrecy, um, which is a, a stronger way of doing SSL such that if the government were to obtain a, a master key, it would not be able to decrypt millions of people's transactions. Uh, and we want to see more of that. We want to see more adoption of Start TLS, which is encryption between email servers. You know, right now we uh, have encryption between us and Gmail, for example, through SSL, but not necessarily between the servers that are exchanging our emails. So I think you're going to see, in response to this, hopefully, uh, a hardening of the internet in a variety of ways that I think will be good for security uh, of internet users. And, and we definitely promote that and hope to see more of that. Yeah, I think I, this is this is a, an important piece of a, this this broader conversation about uh, a short-term approach that is probably that apparently has yielded some some successes, but longer term raises these real risks about um, uh, making Americans actually more vulnerable and less secure and hurting our broader uh, values uh, internationally. I just think you know there's a certain community which finds these issues extremely important and I think is quite surprised by what's happened in the context of the broader debate. Uh, I think this is this is part of it, and I, and I suspect that we are going to be learning more um, as we go forward, that the conversation a couple months from now may not look like this one. I think it does squarely tee up, though, this question about that we've have been, that's been working for a while about the guarantees of capability and whether that's going to be a policy that we accept or reject going forward. What the rules are going to be for getting access to these these kinds of uh, tools for, by the government, and this broader international question, right, about what are other governments going to do and how are we going to deal with it. So I think it's, it's just it's a central component uh, of that. Thanks. Uh, there, if you just put your name and affiliation. Uh, sure. uh, there are mics above you. All right. <coughs> I'm Chris Segoyan. I work for the ACLU. Three sort of points slash questions. Um, in 1993, it was revealed that NSA had worked with NIST to um, collaborate on the digital signature standard. Uh, that was uh, initially NIST denied any involvement of NSA, and it was only after the Computer Scientists for Social Responsibility sued NIST and obtained those documents under FOIA that they were able to reveal that NSA had in fact played a major role in this algorithm. This algorithm turned out to be extremely brittle. It wasn't backdoor, but it was extremely brittle such that if one particular thing failed, the whole algorithm collapsed. Um, so fool me once, right? This is not the first time that NIST has been engaging in shenanigans. I don't think we should be surprised that, that they've been caught this the second time. Um, that's the first point. Uh, Alan mentioned earlier that uh, several companies have been sort of bending over backwards to distance them themselves from allegations of back doors, and, and I would just remind you that um, we learned this summer that Skype had in fact put a back door in, in, its, in its service, and when um, pushed on that point and asked by the press, Microsoft issued a very, very carefully worded statement to, to basically say, look, we may be forced to provide um, continued access to systems when we upgrade them. Um, that's all they said uh, on, on that particular point. The Guardian said they received an order from the Attorney General. We don't know what kind of order, we don't know under which statute, but where, whereas some companies have distanced themselves from those claims, Microsoft has not in fact denied that they modified Skype, or that Skype in fact modified its service before Microsoft bought them to be able to provide voice and video taps to the government. Um, I'll note also that Google continues to refuse to reveal whether or not they, they have the ability to do law enforcement intercepts or FaceTime 
and their hangout, or not suffer based on their hangout service. So um, we don't know even if that service is safe. Um, the third point uh, that it also is substantive to what Alan said uh, about you know the, the Brazilians are, are, are considering legislation and other countries are considering that and transparency would help. But the fact is that the NSA can obtain a valid court order, a valid FISA order for the communications of foreign government officials and foreign government leaders. That's there's there's no uh, disagreement that that information constitutes foreign intelligence surveillance information. You would have to be a fool to be a Brazilian government official and trust your emails to Google, or to Microsoft, or to Facebook, or to any US company. I'm not talking about dragnet surveillance here, I'm not talking about surveillance of activists, but no government official in their right mind would ever trust their communications to a foreign-owned service. And, and, and I'd like to just to get your, your view on, on that particular point. As long as the emails are stored in the clear, at some point on a US server, why would a foreign official ever Trust that service. So I, I think this is our fear. Is I think the fear is that that's exactly the way that a lot of people are going to be looking at this. Now you could say that there's actually a little bit more, uh, not a lot more, but a little bit more to the legal process. Uh, and somebody who, who looks like they want to uh, say something about it, but uh, there's there's more to the legal process. Uh, here in the U.S., but not a lot more, and um, and you, and you're right. And so I think the the point that I think all of us have been trying to make up here is that uh, if you are if you are a foreign government official, if you're a foreign company that's in, that's concerned about uh, uh, industrial espionage or doesn't trust the U.S. government, you're going to be having this conversation. You say, why should I be using a U? Why should I be using Amazon Web Services? Why should I be using uh, Why should I be using Google Docs? Why should I be using Gmail or Hotmail? And, um, but foreign government emails are fair game. That's that's yeah. part of NSA's mission, right? No, I agree. And so that that's the danger here. Um, it's very much that you drive the traffic away, that the count that people will seek other services, traffic will go other places, they will put countermeasures in place to encrypt their traffic um, in ways that can't be decrypted, not just uh, link encryption, but um, uh, uh, end-to-end encryption independent of the services. And um, and I think that is why you're seeing the companies desperately try to distance themselves, as you said, from uh, to try and put some perspective on how few of these orders they believe they're receiving, and to try to do whatever they can to say, to give some comfort about not building in back doors. Because as we see, there's a category of companies that are very user facing, that are very global. Companies like Google and Facebook get more than half of their revenue from outside of the United States, and um, they know that. Uh, is not in their economic interests to have this lack of trust for the reasons that you just said. Okay, we have a lot of questions, so we'll be wrapping up. Yeah, I yeah, was going to say some of the same things that Chris said, but I want to put it in the framework of. You just uh, introduce yourself. I'm sorry, Milton Mueller, uh, Syracuse University. Hi. Um, the point is not just that you'd have to be a fool to be a government official to use these American services. The point is. We've divided the world into nation states that assign rights to people based on their territorial citizenship. And if you're a foreigner in the US, you have no rights. And you, you talk about reestablishing trust through some quick action. It just seems to me to be incredibly naive in, in its hopefulness. Because once you set in motion a process by which states start realigning their data flows with their territorial boundaries, it seems to be irreversible. I mean, we're already doing this. We're saying don't buy Huawei equipment, right? Uh, isn't this going to be a chain reaction inevitably in which, and, and how do you, in, this, in the context of global internet governance, how do you assign rights or legislate rights for people globally, which is what you really need to do to protect the internet, uh, when the process is driven by nation states? I, mean, I thought we were having a very gloomy panel, and apparently we're incredibly naive in our hopefulness. Um, <laughs> uh, I am. So the short answer is, like, we could we could spend hours and hours talking about this. I don't think there's a known answer to how to do this. I think that there, but there there's a sorry sorry no simple answer. Real risks here. I will be a little bit of an optimist to say that I do think that the U.S. The, despite the conversations we've been having, that there are lots of reasons that people should have faith in the, <coughs> in the U.S. rule of law. Um, 
there are things that we could do, increase transparency, disavowing certain practices on the part of our government, and ultimately beefing up the standards for access to, to data um, that would... To include foreigners. Well, we have that conversation has not started yet, but we have to think about what a scalable approach looks like that would say what our government does is the same thing we want other governments to do. And, uh, but we are early days in having that conversation. I think what we really need is a system of denationalized liberalism, um, which is, is a reference to a concept in Milton's book, uh, Networks and States, which is fabulous. Um, I mean, I, this, is, this is in many ways the question of the era, uh, which is in a globalized network world, how do we assign rights in a way that does not immediately disempower anyone who uses the global network? Uh, we need a way of conceptualizing human rights such that states don't merely owe human rights obligations to the people within their territory, but also to the people who communicate through their territory. And we don't have a framework for that yet, but we desperately need it, and I think it's, it's sort of the project of a lifetime. Um, I don't know if it's my lifetime or not, but someone's <laughs> lifetime. Um, any, good, any interested uh, parties? Yeah, I, anyone, anyone, anyone yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name is Hugh Reinstadt. I'm going to speak up for the dark side mm -hmm. because uh, in the late I hear it's 60s, very powerful. Dark side. I'm, no, I'm sorry. Star Wars joke. Well, what did you say? <laughs> I said I hear it's very powerful. The dark side. Well, the case so is: Have any of you ever served in the military? No, sir. Have any of you ever been on the dark side at all? Have you ever had dealt with? I'm not cleared if that's what you're asking. Communications at all. You know, the catch to it is the other side is really, you know, how many people in here use Biden? You use Biden? I used it last week. But how many, how many, what type of security clearance do you have? None. That's okay. Go ahead. Google. If I were to trust Google, I don't trust Google for email. You know why? Google Maps. They go out into the community and they map everything that is in that community. There's more intelligence value in Google, what Google's doing, and trying to get into NSA. NSA, in the late 60s, early 70s, we had something called Autodent, which became the internet in a different way. Autodent handled the transmission of all the three-letter acronyms. And you better believe that even back then, the Russians were trying to get into it. I had to go down and talk to the FBI. Why? They intercepted one of my emails that I sent. Why? I had met one of the Russian 11 spies. I'm glad they did. But the catch to it is, unless you search on the black side and see the value of what we're doing here, you can speak as academics easily about our constitutional rights and all that. But unless you've been out there and saw the value of these intelligence reports and everything that they're gathering, it's easy to say what you're saying but take a look on the black side, dark side one time, and just say, wait, there is some vice to what they're doing. And, and I, I don't think that anybody, we should, we should discount, and I, I, hopefully it doesn't come across that we are discounting the importance of law enforcement, the law enforcement and national security values here. I, I think that we should just recognize that the American people expect that their security is going to be protected and value these things. So it is really about trying to figure out how we protect both of these interests, right? And I think the conversation we're having here is about have we struck the right balance? Are, we, are the right rules and oversight? Because nobody is saying that capabilities should absolutely disappear. I think the conversation is ultimately need, needs to be about what is actually happening out there, and then what should the rules of the road be so that the very good men and women who serve in those capacities have clear rules and know what they can and can't do. Um, yeah, just uh, sort of picking up on that, that last point. Um, to what extent, I'm sorry, my name is Sean Waterman and I'm a reporter for the Washington Times. Um, to what extent is, you know, the, 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 the future of this problem not, uh, no longer, will no longer confine itself to states, right? So, you know, I mean, Google does have an enormous amount of data Right, about each of us if we are users of it, uh, and so and Facebook, and I mean, you know, I mean the argument is the the, the firms can't toss you in jail like the government can, 
But I mean, you know, what about non-state actors? Uh, you know, basic because we know that this technology proliferates, right? You know, malware developed uh, initially, uh, you know, like Stuxnet, right? That is, it proliferates. That the, the capabilities trickle down. What about the, in the future, is this going to remain a problem uh, that's, you know, that only confined to states? Uh, well, I would just say, uh, first of all, obviously the non-state actors are incredibly important here, and there is a lot of data. There's a whole other debate, and it's not today's debate, about uh, the rules that should apply, uh, privacy and otherwise, to, you know, companies and others who gather data. That's important for me. I would just say, uh, for this point of view, I do think we have to recognize there is a pretty big difference between the states and non-state actors, right? Microsoft can't throw you in jail or put you on the no-fly list um, or, uh, you know, um, render you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yes. Um, and, and so I, I just think, you know, our conversation here is, has been, and, and there's just, there's a, there's, there's a piece of it that is really just about the importance of the sovereign and the things that the sovereign can do. Uh, it is in, intimately linked with the landscape, which is the data that's being collected out there and the services that are being offered out there. So you can't disconnect them completely. But I would say there's, there are, we should just recognize there's another set of rules and debates that we can have. Uh, Bob Gellman, um, I have a question. Look at this snippet of the Snowden uh, allegations. We have to know all the facts. We see that the good governments are, are engaging together in all kinds of activities that subvert uh, um, the internet and the kinds of things that the good guys thought were good. There are other governments that are subverting the internet much more covertly. Um, they're also subverting, the good governments are also subverting companies that are involved here. My question is, where is there an institution that we can trust to lead us out of this? Is there anyone at all that anyone can put any faith in that's going to be able to set standards and do anything that's going to effectively protect I don't know for sure how to answer that question, so I'm going to answer it with a story about what I read in The Guardian yesterday, because I thought it was interesting. Um, they just started a live blog about their, their NSA files, the Snowden allegations, as you said. And the first story that I saw on it yesterday was, where is there going to be a data heaven? Like, where is that just going to pop up? Um, which is something that somebody responded to me and said that Neil Stevenson had asked that question a very long time ago in Cryptonomicon. Yes, it's, it's true. I think now there is, it's going to be interesting moving forward what we see that's new, um, that we haven't seen yet. New actors pop up, new companies, new business models um, in order to deal with exactly the problems that you just said. And can I just add, so yes, I think very much there will be new actors and new capabilities, new tools that are given to users uh, from people that they trust uh, somehow for some reason. Uh, I wouldn't give up on uh, on the good governments, right? I think it you know we 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 can't give up because we are you know we're here, and uh, so geographic sovereignty still matters. I think that the government government does not act as a monolith, that there are lots of different perspectives within government. Um, we're seeing the actions of part of government, uh, and I think there are other perspectives within government and other possibilities for oversight um, and, and standing for things that we believe in that will, that could promote trust. So I've, I'm not, I, I guess I am maybe either hopelessly naive or a little bit of an optimist, but I, I do think that there's still, there are things that the U.S. government could do, that this administration could do, that Congress could do with oversight and with bills that provide more transparency that would actually infuse some trust back into the system. It may not get us all the way there, and we have a long, this is going to be a, a difficult breach to repair, but I don't think we can give up uh, on this. We have to get the balance right. I'll, I'll echo that sentiment as an American and a patriot, frankly. You know, I do believe that I believe in our constitutional system of government. I believe that if done right, we can constrain the government in a meaningful uh, and appropriate way. And I think that um, in a lot of ways, internet freedom starts at home. We need to address these issues successfully at a local level um, in order for us to be able to successfully address them uh, at a global level. And one of the great concerns is uh, that 
we have delegitimized a lot of our internet freedom work by doing this. And we have empowered uh, many countries who have, um, in order to uh, better enforce their own power over the internet, uh, have been pushing for the UN and in particular the uh, ITU to take a stronger hand in internet governance. Um, I think that ultimately some sort of centralized control over internet governance in a one government, one vote model would be bad for online free speech and online freedom generally. And I'm very concerned. I mean, I know that what has come out has strengthened the hand of those who want that to happen. Um, I think that the, the only effective response to that is to, is to uh, focus on local reform and ensuring that what your country does makes sense and, uh, you know, and follows the golden rule, ultimately. <laughs> Um, if, if you don't think it's acceptable for another country to do it to you, you shouldn't be doing it to another country. Well, I'm both um, surprised and encouraged that we ended up on optimistic note. Um, so I just join me in thanking the panel for uh, being here.